Cadi. So uh, next up, we have Fernanda Viegas. Fernanda uh, works at Google. She is on the Google Brain team uh, and also the co-leader of the Big Picture Group, uh, which is in Cambridge, at the Google office in Cambridge. Um, Fernanda has been a longtime uh, creator of beautiful visualizations. Uh, some of her earliest work that I know of and what really uh, uh, introduced me to her work was, uh, uh, were some visualizations that she made in graduate school visualizing her email. And uh, these were really not only beautiful visualizations, but really helped, uh, uh, I think, Fernanda and her audience understand something about the communication between herself and others. Um, she's gone on to, to uh, work very closely with her collaborator, Martin Wattenberg. They've made a number of visualization tools. Many Eyes is one of the most uh, well-known. It was a public site for uploading data and quickly creating visualizations that you could share. Uh, and they've also created a number of visualizations that have been widely imitated. One of the most uh, influential, I think, were, was the Wind Maps project. Uh, and today she'll be talking about visualization in the context of machine learning. Thank you, Manish, and thank you for having me here today. Um, so, it, this is going to be fast. There's a lot to talk about today. Um, so, I'm going to start with just giving you a, a, a notion of our team. As Manish said, I have been working with Martin Wattenberg, who was the very first person there on the left. Uh, Martin and I have been collaborating for over 12 years now, which is huge. Um, and, and this is our team, uh, the big picture team, which is part of Google Brain. And, and above, uh, you can see some of, some of the work that we do. Uh, it's, it's heavily visualization uh, based. So we are investigating different ways in which visualization can help with machine learning. Um, but I'm also the co-leader of the PEAR initiative at Google, and that stands for People Plus AI uh, Research. Um, and that is um, the first cross-Google initiative to bring design thinking and human-computer interaction to machine learning, which I think is deeply needed. Um, and um, some of the things that Pear has been doing, which I'm very excited about, one is we've been open sourcing a lot of tools, a lot of them visualizations, actually, um, to help others uh, work with machine learning. Uh, we have educational materials. We obviously have academic publications. And then the last thing I want to point to is a whole collection of essays being authored by designers themselves at Google who are working with machine learning as a design material, which I think is a big challenge. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about that collection as well. All right, so to start at the start, where did we start with uh, machine learning and visualization? We started with this project, which actually uh, was started as an intern project with an intern um, ham from, uh, and I can never, I, I, it's really hard to, to say his last name. You heard it. <laughs> Once a Pasquak. So ham, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, pronounce your last name. But um, Jeff's student was interning with us, and we started this project that ended up launching live with TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is the big Google machine learning platform. And this visualization, which allows you to automatically visualize your machine learning models, huge, massive, very complex models, was incredibly useful for the TensorFlow community. It was so useful that a lot of the, the sort of um, critiques around uh, TensorFlow would point out to the visualization as one of the main differentiators and one of the really sort of pioneering things uh, that was coming out uh, from this open source package. So that obviously made us very happy. It also meant a lot to us that the developers themselves were changing the way they were, for instance, building their graphs so that the visualization would make sense to them, so that the visualization wouldn't fit their mental model of their really complicated networks. So in other words, 
the engineers and the developers were willing to adjust certain things in their models to make sure that the visualization made sense because this became also a communication um, uh, channel. This is, a, this is kind of our second visualization project with machine learning, and this was an interesting one because it started out as an internal Google tool. What we had, so Google um, uh, prides itself in being an AI-first company, and what that means is that Google has had to spend a ton of time and effort retraining its engineering workforce to work with machine learning. Um, and that takes a lot of time. And so one of the things we did is to uh, create this visualization for, for an educational purpose, which was, um, I'm going to demo this, which was to, to train our own engineers internally in what exactly is happening, for instance, when you're trying to train a, a, a a machine learning system. And so we have you know, some data set that we're interested in classifying, we're interested in making sure that all the orange dots get classified as orange and all the blue dots get classified as blue. That's the goal for our machine. This is our little network here. It's very tiny. It only has one hidden layer here and two neurons, okay? And as you can see, as I mouse over, I'm trying to, to show how these neurons see the world, okay? How they're thinking about classifying this world. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play this. I'm going to actually train my network. And my network is doing its best to try to solve for my goal here. It's not doing a very good job. It's, it's not being able to completely separate the orange from the, the blue dots. That's okay, so I'm gonna pause it. I'm gonna add a couple more neurons here, and then I'm gonna train it again, and boom, it gets it, okay? Um, why does this matter? It matters because before, for you to do something as simple as what I did here, the engineer uh, would have to edit their model. They would have to go to their control, uh, their command line interface, edit the model, recompute everything, see what happened, then they would have to do it again. It takes a long time. The fact that you can just very quickly do this, and then not only do this, but you can inspect how each one of these neurons is seeing the world is huge. Um, and it, this became so successful within Google that we decided, well, this is great, maybe we can share this with the world. And so we open sourced um, this uh, visualization, this network, um, and it, to, to great effect. So internally at Google, this visualization by itself meant that we sped up training by 10 times. So that's huge. Uh, it's now part of every intro to machine learning across the company. And externally, I was really happy to see that it's being adopted by all sorts of top uh, U.S. universities. Uh, it's also being adopted around the world uh, whenever people are trying to, to introduce and to try to, to talk about uh, how these systems work. Um, it's also been forked a ton of times um, in, in GitHub. All right, so now that we talked a little bit about the networks, the models themselves, let's think about another thing that's really huge in machine learning, and that is different from traditional programming, which is you really care about your data, like a ton. Your data is the recipe for success or disaster a lot of times. And so that probably means we need new development, development tools for dealing with data. Um, and so one of the things we did is to create, a, from a visualization perspective, a very simple visualization that allows you to look at your data kind of all at once and play with it, your data and facet things in different ways. It's, it's called facets. Um, and so imagine you have a situation where you're, you, you have a system that is trying to classify photos, okay? And it's looking at the little images there and trying to tell me if there's a dog or a cat or a ship or a car. And this is kind of one of the hello world example data sets from machine learning. It's called CIFAR 10. Um, and it's, that's all it is. It's a data set of images, and they are tiny images. And so let me show you the visualization we created. So basically, there's no good tool today 
to look at your data set. And so what ends up happening, so now I'm showing you CIFAR here. That's the visualization, that's the beginning of it. You can zoom in and you can be like, oh yeah, yeah, lots of cars there, lots of birds, okay, all right. And the reason why these images are separated into classes, it's because humans have labeled these images, okay? And so this is the ground truth. We know this is true, okay? And now the, the, the goal for my machine system is to actually get to this classification. And so what happens a lot of times is you will feed your system a ton of data. You will not even know, for instance, that I don't know, maybe half of your images are blank. They're useless because you're never looking at your data. It's hard to look at massive, massive amounts of data. So one of the things we can do with visualization is we can start playing with this. Now that I have this, I can already see that there are differences in hues, but now I'm gonna play a different game here where I'm gonna be like, oh, what is the distribution of hues within the categories themselves? Okay, it makes sense that for airplane, I have a ton of blue. Uh, and okay, of the, of the many classes of animals, uh, I have kind of earthy green tones, that's great. Now I'm gonna start doing other things, ah, if this will allow me. I'm gonna create a confusion matrix. A confusion matrix is when I compare what the ground truth is, so remember what humans said, each one of those, pic those images were, versus what my system says. So the good news for me is that there's, the places that are the most populated is this diagonal, which is where the computer and the humans agree. So that's good. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to filter out, filter out that diagonal. So everything that's correct is gonna be gone. So now I'm left with the actual confusion. This is why it's called the confusion matrix. So these are the problem areas. This is where my system is getting very confused. And I can tell just by the size of these cells that this is not good news for me. It's a very populated cell here, and this is not good news. And interestingly enough, this is a confusion between dogs and cats. My, my system is not doing very, very well between dogs and cats. Okay, that's how I start debugging. Maybe I need to show it more data. Maybe I need to do better. So there are many other things uh, you can do with this facets visualization. Again, it's open sourced, and, and um, please go play with it. Um, I, wanna, I wanna move on to a few other things. Um, the other thing about machine learning that is super important and that where visualization can play a really crucial role is the fact that machine learning most of the time is dealing with massively high dimensional spaces. And these are spaces that are really non-intuitive to us. Um, and so it's hard to grasp what's happening in these spaces. So um, to give you a sense of how visualization can, can start helping, uh, let's look at another Hello World example of machine learning, which is this data set here, which is nothing more than a data set of handwritten digits. It's called MNIST, okay? Um, and so the whole idea is that your system is going to be able to tell the zeros from the ones, from the twos, no matter how your numbers are written. And so how do we do this? We turn images into vectors, okay? So we're gonna start going from pixels to high dimensions. So what I do is I look at an image of a, of a, of a number, of a digit, and I look at each, each pixel in that image, and I look at its color. And it's going to vary between white and black. If I see a pixel that's white, I give it a value of one. If I see a pixel that's black, I give it a value of zero. And anything in between, I give it a value of 0 0.5, 0 0.7, whatever happens to be my gray value. I do, the, I do that for every pixel in my image, and I end up with a vector. So I've transformed an image into a vector of numbers. Okay, the, this vector is going to have over 700 dimensions because I have over 700 pixels in my image. All right, so now let's look at how we visualize this. So this is a tool called the embedding projector and it is again another tool that we've open sourced. 
And what I've done here is I've let this tool try to, try to project what it thinks the clusters are for those numbers you were looking at in the previous slide. And what I can see, and I can interact with this, is that it's doing an okay job. I can see a cluster of blue here that are the, the zeros. I can see a cluster of twos. I can see a cluster of ones that has this interesting shape. Um, and the ones, it's, inter it's interesting, these ones here at the bottom are very straight. When I go all the way to the top, the ones are slanted to the right. I, I didn't tell the machine anything about this. It just finds the slant because, again, it's comparing those vectors and figuring out which vectors are closer to each other. The other thing that this visualization lets me do is that it shows me very clearly places where things are confusing. Oh, look, I have a bunch of twos here in the middle of the zeros. Okay, that could be a problem. So it's misclassifying certain things. Um, I can also click on something and see its nearest neighbor. So I just clicked on a zero. And if you can read here, the nearest neighbors, the third nearest neighbor is a number two, not a zero. Oh, that's a problem. Okay, so again, it gives me ways of inspecting how my system is doing, um, how well it's doing, and other places where it's not doing so well. So, now that we looked at the, at the Hello World version, let's look at a real system, a real production system, google size system. So, uh, about a year and a half ago, Google came out with something called the multilingual translation systems. These are systems that are incredible in the sense that you can input multiple languages. So I can put something in English or in Portuguese or in French, and it can translate to multiple languages out. And one of the things that is even more incredible is that it the system sometimes can do zero-shot translation. In other words, it may have seen training data from English to Portuguese and Portuguese to English, and then from English to Japanese and Japanese to English, and somehow it figures out how to translate well between Portuguese and Japanese, even though it never saw training data along those axes, okay? So part of the question that the researchers who were building these systems had was when you think about the embeddings. So remember the numbers, that, that high dimensional space visualization? Those are called embeddings, okay? If you think about that kind of high dimensional space for multiple languages in these kinds of translation systems, do they look like this on the left where each language is separate, so let's say English is in blue here, and Portuguese is in green, and Spanish is in yellow, or do they look like the image on the right, where everything is sort of mixed together, okay? Why does that matter? It matters because um, geometry matters in these embedding spaces, in the following sense, if you're looking at language in a high dimensional space, things that are close together usually have similar meanings or are found in similar kinds of sentences. If I have multiple languages and I have the string home showing up together with the string casa, which is home in Portuguese and Spanish, it means that the system figured out something about the fact that conceptually, semantically, these are the same, even though the strings are different, okay? So that matters because it could give us some indications about the, the, the beginnings of a, of a universal language, of the system understanding something about an interlingua. Okay? So that was the question that the people building these systems had no, no idea about. And so we started working with them. And so let's think about what an embedding might look like for a sentence. So imagine I have this kind of sentence. This stratosphere extends from 10 kilometers to 50 kilometers in altitude. 
it might look something like this in an embedding space, okay? And what I'll do in my visualization is I'm going to connect the dots. So that's a sentence in embedding space, okay? When I translate this sentence into another language, what does that look like? Does it look like this, where the, the version in English is hanging out by itself here on the left, and the version in Portuguese is hanging out by itself here on the right? Or, again, does it look like this, where it doesn't matter the string, but, it, but the concept, the meaning matters? And so, um, to show you the big reveal, let me go here. This is the visualization of a multilingual system that looks at English, Japanese, and Korean. Each one of these languages is in a different color here. So Korean is blue, English is yellow, and Japanese is red. Okay? And again, I'm visualizing sentences that got translated. So first thing. Do you see a big blob of red hanging out by itself and a big blob of yellow hanging out by itself? And a big, are the colors separated? No, they're not, right? So that's potentially the first sign here of what, what happened. Now, uh, let me find my favorite uh, little um, sentence here. The stratosphere is in the range of 10 kilometers to 50 kilometers. I just clicked on that, and now it highlighted for me the nearest neighbors, and I'm going to mouse over them. All the nearest neighbors are in that vicinity, um, and um, no matter what the language, okay? So I'm going to go down here. Um, so that, that was huge. That was literally a scientific insight that you couldn't have without visualization. Oh, okay, I'm almost done. Okay, so I'm gonna have to rush. The other thing I wanna show is the same visualization for a sister um, model, one that has Portuguese, French, and English. What looks different here? Anyone? The red, yes, the red, the red hanging out by itself. So that is a pair of languages hanging out by itself. It's not clustering. Guess what? We went back to the researchers. We're like, what's up with this? They ran a statistical analysis. They're like, oh, wow, that entire neighborhood are low quality translations. So again, the geometry matters. And this starts to give you clues about how you might want to go about debugging your system. And yes, the system is starting to maybe show some signs of um, a universal language, a higher level understanding of how these languages relate to each other. Okay, very quickly, the last thing I wanna talk about is fairness. I don't have time to explain, <laughs> but I wanna show uh, this quick visualization, again, in terms of visualization, a very simple visualization that we did. This was a simulation of um, loans, bank loans, and how do you deal with different thresholds for giving bank loans if you have different populations, if you have a blue population and an orange population with different dis distributions. One of the tricky things about machine learning fairness is that there are multiple definitions of fairness, and when you were deciding how to be fair in your system, you pretty much have to choose one of them. You can't have it all. And so what this visualization was getting at were different definitions. It simulates what it means to be one group unaware or have demographic parity or do equal opportunity. And the reason why I talk about this is that um, this went viral as a way to communicate the subtleties uh, in this highly technical mathematical field of, of machine learning fairness to a much broader audience. So we saw people engaging in debate. We got, we got a bunch of emails. We got emails from criminal justice departments saying, can we build a simulation like this so we can understand what some of the trade-offs are in, ter in terms of fairness uh, for our, our own work. Um, and so to finish off, and 
another thing, an another good thing about making these visualizations open source. So this is work that was done at the Media Lab, just came out, I think, a week ago or two. Um, again, around machine learning fairness and uh, um, problems in facial recognition in terms of gender uh, and, and racial analysis. And again, was using facets, the, the visualization that you saw me playing with in, ter in terms of, of, uh, of um, photos. So in conclusion, the, the last thought I want to leave you with is that these visualizations serve multiple purposes. Uh, they serve an educational purpose. They are very important for scientific com uh, communication. They're also super important for the engineering work of debugging these systems. Um, and then finally, the fact that they are, could be really important, I think, ever more for understanding the societal impact of some of these technologies and, and how the, the rubber meets the road. Is that how you say it in English? Yeah. And, uh, and so who are the different audiences? I think we're talking about here not only about scientists and experts, I think we're talking about a much broader range of, of different audiences uh, for this kind of work. And uh, that's it. Thank you.